Coming up next, the spookening reads Young Goodman Brown, because this is a high school literature class. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody. Hey. Hey. <laughs> it's time for us to do the most high school literature thing that we, I think we've ever done. And we've done some things like Pride and Prejudice. You know, we really haven't. I was going to suddenly go into the list of things we've done, but what have we done? Like, we've not done 1984. Nope. We've not done Scarlet Letter. Nope. We did have Fahrenheit 451. We did do Fahrenheit 451. We did, what's that? Catcher in the Rye. We did do yeah, Catcher in the did. Rye. Those are probably the ones, I guess. That we, we did that Steinbeck. Uh, we did Old Man in the Sea. That can sometimes. Uh, yeah, but stick. that's. I meant the Steinbeck. Yeah, one. we did East of, of Eden. Mice and Men. We did of Mice and Men. That's right. I'd forgotten that we did that. Well, this is the Spookening. I am your humble and obedient ghost, the Lord of Validation himself, or should I say the gore of Valacation, a vacation to Gorida. Uh, <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. You're slipping, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is like my fifth year in a row to have to come up with these puns, so I'm doing the best that I can here. We've got J- Brandon F- Fast... Wow, I can't even talk. That's how bad I'm feeling. Fast got, and Furious. We've got Brandon Ch- Fast and Furious, Chast Fiend himself. That's right, Nathan. The scholar who's vroom, vroom. a mauler of bleeding. And, of course, we've got Jake Menskiller, the pastor who's a master of bleeding. Yo, what's up? Beastmaster Funky Town and Ghost Brandon. Wow, I don't even have to Halloweenify those. Ooh. But guys, we are in the middle of a five day marathon, or should I say, scarathon of scary stories. And today we are going to talk about an author that we, in our five years that we've been, is this, this is year four, I guess, right? I keep saying five, but this is our fourth year, right? I have yeah. no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been yeah. a while. This is our fourth. This is, year, that was the year number gore that we're doing. And we have not done Hawthorne. We have never done the Scarlet Letter. And I would actually like to do the Scarlet Letter. I think it'd be interesting. I don't feel like high school ruined it for me. Um, Hawthorne may have ruined it for me, but I don't think high school did. But today we are talking about something that every high schooler ever has to read, which is Young Goodman Brown. The spooky <laughs> story of devilry and witchcraft in old New England. By Nathaniel Hawthorne. I don't know if I read this in high school or not. Did you not? Well, I, it would have been the kind of thing that I would have skipped out of principle. Yeah. But well, it also feels like maybe I ended up reading it anyway. Well, we will decide whether you should have skipped it on principle or not as we discuss it, starting with a little context from our favorite chess fiend. Yeah, let's do this. So, Brandon, take us on a journey into the twisted imagination of Nathaniel Hawthorne. <laughs> well, actually, it's not so twisted, Nathan. Is it not? No, it's pretty twisted. This is the guy that wrote The Minister's Black Veil, Brandon. Um, he's different, though, than Poe in the sense that he's not... A hack? Is what you guys would say. As morbid, right? <laughs> he's not as... Yeah, he's not as much a hack, but also he's not just... Hated given, by snobs? He's not as given to the <laughs> grotesque. The fact that you don't just love Agatha Christie befuddles me. <laughs> Everybody's entitled to their opinions on everything. Yes, Brandon. I said the word befuddled. Yeah. Oh, man. Brandon. If Nathan had read and loved Agatha Christie when he was 11, then Agatha Christie would be the hero of the bookening. Yeah. Just like Edgar Allan Poe is apparently the hero of the bookening. Well, Jake, yeah. you're skinny and Brandon's <laughs> fat. We should get C3PO to translate for Brandon. <laughs> Why is it coming back on me? I'm not even that fat. It was more funny to take it out on you. <laughs> Nathan, I've I've We should to... get him to translate you get C three PO to translate for you because you're just like Luke Skywalker. That's... Thank you, Nathan. C three PO never translated for Luke Skywalker. But he could. Hey, I've got something to translate. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Brandon, you're not that fat. Jake, you're not that thin. Everything's fine. It's good. <laughs> All right, let's hear about Hawthorne. <laughs> I'm over here crying. Not really. What was I saying? Oh, yeah, so he actually was contemporaries with Poe. Yeah, he was born in 1804. Straight up contemporaries. Straight up contemporaries. You know who was born in 1812? Uh, Charles Dickens. 
the yeah, war. Yeah, the, the war. The war of. <laughs> a little <laughs> war. There was the Great Comet of 1812. Dickens was born. Twain was born. Twain, Twain, Twain was born. He came in on that comet and he went out on that comet. That's right. Old Haley. Yeah, that's right. It was, uh, mm-hmm. But these guys, they were born eight years before it. So they didn't quite get that literary genius that um, Twain and Dickens would get from that magical meteor dust <laughs> sprinkling down on their baby cribs. <laughs> Number of facts learned about Nathaniel Hawthorne in this context so far. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> One, 1804. 1804, <laughs> and he was born Haythorn. H-A-T-H-O-R-N-E. He added the W hey, later. Thorn. There's not a whole, I mean, what do we want to know about this I guy? don't know, Brandon, I'm he sorry. He was an embittered Puritan. He had a lot of Puritan ancestry. He was born in Salem, Massachusetts. He would move away from Salem, Massachusetts, but then his dad was a sea captain. He would die. His mom would get widowed, and he would move back to Salem, Massachusetts. Wait, he died? Oh, no, his, his dad died. His dad okay. died out at sea, and so his mom would move back to Salem, Massachusetts, mm-hmm. of all places. Of all places. And then he would later in his life write this book that, my students can't for the life of them understand because it's so purple in its prose and every sentence is like trying to untie the, what is the- is The it Gordian the, Knot. The Gordian Knot, yeah. And none of them can do it because their minds aren't sharp enough. And it's hard enough when your mind is sharp enough because it's just like you're beating your head against a wall because this guy didn't know how to write a sentence that was clear and straightforward. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> Well, what are Passive we talking about? Passive aggression begets aggression. <laughs> aggression, <Yeah>. aggression. <laughs> <laughs> leads to the dark side. <laughs> yeah. How have I? I've, I have just kind of become the dark. Only huh. pain will you find there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just, I'm just electrocuting all the authors we read now. <laughs> all right. So Hawthorne. Yeah. His dad was a sea captain. And he died. was Haythorn originally. Right. Haythorn. And he changed it to Hawthorne. Okay. Because he had this tortured... All these guys are emo, all these dark romantics. It's like Shelley and Shelley and Keats and, oh, not so much Keats. Keats was a weirdo. But then you also had Byron and then you had Poe and then you had, all, all these guys had this tortured relation to their past and they just couldn't come to terms with their past and the past. So Shelley went and she probably first had relations with Pierce Bish Shelley, Percy Bish Shelley on her mother's grave. I don't think we mentioned that in our... <laughs> Yeah, I think it got context. cut out, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so they all had this tormented relation to their past that they couldn't come to terms with, and they were overshadowed by their past, and so they were haunted by these ghosts of their past. We probably could have talked about that with Poe, mm-hmm. because that's definitely some psychoanalytical stuff going on there. These ghosts that you're literally haunted by that you can't get away from becomes this building with the death and the specter that's inside of it. Mm-hmm. But here we have uh, Haythorn, Nathaniel Haythorn. He adds a W to his name, probably when he's 20, and he's going to, his, I think you say it, Bodoin College? Sure. Who knows? He went there because there's like some family ties, and he, but he was a lazy student. He wasn't a great student, but he changes it then because, do you know why? Because he didn't want to be remembered as the sort of Haythorn that had originally come and settled in Salem, Massachusetts, because these were the Puritans who were known as being hard-nosed legalists, and his grandfather, I think William Haythorn was his name. Let me see my notes. Yeah. See the guy that presided, one of the judges at the the old Salem witch trial? Well, not that, but he was known for being very harsh in his sentencing, just in general. So, And that's where he got this idea of this Puritan, ironclad, legalistic, you had to have the appearance of perfection, but it was a very stoic, black clothing, pleasure rejecting sort of puritanism which is just which is basically there were branches and sects of that mm-hmm. but it was a lie and so hawthorne yeah. is primarily responsible for us having, having a black image of puritans. the reason we yeah. think of puritans as being dreary stern it's, mean, be- it's because characters. of because- this guy because he had a tormented relationship to this image of who his grandfather was is this guy that he well him and then later the sociologist what's his name yeah and also arthur miller who have we talked about him at this point? Oh, we're going to, so yeah. we, we can hold off on... I mean, these, it's, these work together. Max though. Weber. Yeah. And so they work together and they give us this... Well, I mean, they don't literally work together, but in <laughs> conjunction, they give us this idea of who the Puritans were. And with, um, with Nathaniel Hawthorne, a lot of it had to do with just his own insecurities about his past, his own desires to be an artist, his own desires to be 
And so while at school, he met the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who Poe would then lampoon and criticize, and also Poe would lampoon and criticize, well, not lampoon, but he would criticize uh, Hawthorne's first book of short stories. And we read the criticism last time. Mm -hmm. I can remind everybody. Poe didn't like allegory. Right. (laughs) He thought allegory was cheap. And it was rarely done well, except in the case of this one French man mm-hmm. who we don't even know. We didn't, I never read him. Had you ever read him? No. What was the name? Uh, no. Who cares? Yeah. yeah, who cares? I have it right here. Um, De La Motte Fouque. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Fouque. Yeah. Um, the un- Undine. Um, so there you go. That's definitely rem- been remembered by posterity. <laughs> but. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, hey, for all my. Uh, whatever it was with the last episode with Poe aside, his essays on literature are pretty useful. He, he was Poe? a good critic. He was a great critic. He was a good critic. I, I, I strongly uh, encourage people to read his uh, his thing, his, his his article. What do you call it? His his essay, Philosophy of Composition, is a good essay that writers should read. It will be helpful to you. Yeah, and T.S. Eliot's right. If only Poe would have listened to his own advice. Right. Some people make better critics than they make. Most people make better critics than they make artists. Yeah, yeah art's difficult. Right. I mean, it's it's a hard thing to do. I was about to make a comment. If only we could have just like limited it to Tolstoy and Austin and a mm-hmm. few select artists, but then they wouldn't be here. Right. So. <laughs> the bookending wouldn't be here. Right, exactly. Oh, we, we'd still be here. We'd just be talking about them the whole time. Mm-hmm. So we get to talk about Hawthorne. Yeah, yeah. Because yay. he lived and he existed. Yep. He was in Massachusetts Bay <laughs> Colony. This is what context is. Coming. Yeah. So this guy, he existed. He's, he may have died at one point. <laughs> he existed. But anyways, it was around this period when he was fairly young that he, so this is 1820s, 1830s. Um, yeah, this would have been in the 18s. So after he graduates from college, he goes and he gets a job as a weigher and gouger at the Boston Custom House making $1,500 a year, which was a decent salary at the time. I mean, so he, he comes from old Puritan stock. He's got some connections. He's not the, he's not the drunk orphan that Edgar Allan Poe was. Um, he, he's got some roots, and so he goes and he makes a kind that of- loser. <laughs> yeah. He kind of makes a living for himself, but then at the same time, he's writing in obscurity for the most part until- um, in 1837, he publishes Twice to Hotels, mm-hmm. which includes Young Goodman Brown. Brown. And so this would be at the age of 33. Cool. Which is younger than all of us. Mm-hmm. So there we go. Well, yeah, at least he had that going for him. Yep. He's done more with his literary career than we have. Yeah. Jake, how many twice told, how many stories named the Minister's Black <laughs> Veil have you written? Zero. Yeah, well, you maybe shouldn't be criticizing Hawthorne then. Just <laughs> yeah. remember that when we get to the part where we. And I think I think for now that's fine because uh, if yeah, we ever we get should to... stop criticizing anyone. Yeah, yeah, because oh. none of us have ever re- written a book. Thousand page Russian novels written by Brennan? Zero. <laughs> yeah, Nathan, that's right. Um, <laughs> if we ever get to the Scarlet Letter, we can do the rest of his. Uh, oh, we will. The rest of his biography. We will. But I think that as far as. Um, he's another member of this romantic tradition, what you can call, apparently is a thing, dark romanticism. Dark romanticism. Which would include things like Wuthering Heights. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of gothic romanticism. Mm-hmm. Um, and he like so his, his shift away from Poe is that he's more interested in the New England inheritance of the, the New Englanders of this sense of guilt and sin. So he's kind of like... He's actually a little bit like the New England version of Flannery O'Connor, mm-hmm. um, except that he has he doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe in a sense of judgment. He just believes in the fact that these people think that there's a sense of judgment and how this affects their life. This ironclad system that then ruins their life because they can't escape it. This sense of guilt and sin and evil. Um, and even though he seems to, it's really difficult. It's like when you read something like the Scarlet Letter, trying to figure out what Hawthorne actually believed. Mm-hmm. I think he, he himself, he kind of had a tormented relationship with all of this. Mm-hmm. He kind of wanted to believe it, but he also wanted to reject it. And he had grandfather issues with, um, which led to very, which led to stories like Young Goodman Brown, where, you know, the whole culmination of the story is Young Goodman Brown seems to have come to the realization, but it might've just been a dream. And so he lives his whole, the rest of his life 
uh, suspicious of everybody mm. until he dies. He certainly does. Yeah. Like, Here's some fun quotes about Hawthorne. You want to hear them? Oh, Brandon. I Herman Melville. Know. He is one of the new and the far be- a far better generation of your writers. This is from The Mosses from an Old Man's famous essay. Cool. Um, his review of that, Mosses from an Old Man's. Um, apparently, Edgar Allan Poe eventually would say, the style of Mr. Hawthorne is purity itself. His tone is singularly effective. Wild, plaintive, thoughtful, in a full accordance with his themes. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Nathaniel Hawthorne's reputation as a writer is a very pleasing fact because his writing is not good for anything. And this is a tribute to the man. Okay. Emerson never made any sense. The fact that that guy even read is a surprise. Henry James said, The fine thing in Hawthorne is that he cared for the deeper psychology and that in his way he tried to become familiar with it. <laughs> good Hashtag condescension. Yeah. Uh, and apparently this guy named Dwykin Kick, <laughs> head of the American <laughs> writers. Dwykin Kick, wait, Dan? <laughs> yeah, he is the most original. The one least indebted to foreign models or literary precedents of any kind. But he's even more original than Dwykin Kick? I guess so. And, um, but people do point to The Scarlet Letter especially as being kind of the first of the great American novels. And it has its own American style in the sense that American literature would be obsessed with this sense of doom and fatality and sin and evil and the weight of oppression that we've had from our religious roots with the pilgrims and the puritans and this even carries over into the southern gothic tradition and Mm -hmm. all this and how americanism has just been haunted by this reality you see that and also being very psychological in its interests you have american literature and then you have russian literature which is it's kind of equivalent there Mm -hmm. so um you see hawthorne he's kind of the progenitor of that he then him, and then he, some would argue Melville would take that um, torch and turn it into a bonfire with Moby Dick. Mm-hmm. Would One day we'll get to have that conversation. One day. <laughs> but today is not that <laughs> today day. Today is not that day. <laughs> today, <laughs> instead, <laughs> we get the privilege <laughs> of talking about little Faith waving her <laughs> really, pink ribbon. I hope that I may not lose my faith. Oh, oh, not no. my faith. She goes riding through the clouds with a bunch of witches, and her pink ribbon falls to the ground. And he goes to the bonfire, and there's the altar with it's good water stuff. that's like blood in it. Are you guys ready to talk about it? You guys have any baggage that you brought to young Goodman Brown that you want to tell us about? I've read it two times, <laughs> including this time. I'm no, not this sure is my third if I time. ever read it the first time or not. I just don't have any strong memory of it. I read. Uh, Scarlet Letter, though. Scarlet Letter. I've read the Scarlet Letter. I've read the Minister's Black Veil. I think I've read. read one. I think I've read Twice Told Tales. Actually, I've just read the collection. Yeah, I've read The Artist of the Beautiful. I've not read that. I've not read any of his other. No, I've not read House of the Seven Gables. Pretty sure The Artist so. of the Beautiful might be Twice Told Tales. Oh, is it? Okay, maybe I have. I don't it's know. the one about the guy who makes the butterfly a little mechanism. Not ringing any bells, no. but maybe it would if I. I've read The Minister's Black Veil. I've read Young Goodman Brown. I've read the Blythe Adele Romance. Which, if we ever get to Scarlet Letter, we will talk about his later life when he gets into mixed wooden with the weird transcendentalist movements, and he goes and he's a part of like a utopian farm for a while. It becomes a failure and stuff like that. <laughs> Those utopian farms just don't seem to work out as well. No. As... Didn't didn't yeah Tolstoy did that too, right? Yeah, I mean Tolstoy was crazy. I just didn't realize that Hawthorne also did it. Yeah, and so then his bitterness about the experience he would that seems to be the way he handled life was he would go and he would experience something. It wouldn't work out for him. He would go and become very bitter about it and then write a novel about it. Well, there or you go. he made fun of it. So, or not me. I mean, he doesn't have a humorous bone in his body. So <laughs> he's, he's not. <laughs> it's all bitterness. I like in this story when the devil goes, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, anyway, Young Goodman Brown. So there's this guy. His name is Brown, Young Goodman. Yeah. And... He's got this wife named Faith. She's got some pink ribbons in her hair. No allegory yet. No allegory yet, no. He bids her goodbye. She says, come back swiftly, husband, that I may not dream the dreams that women dream when husbands stray or something like that. Then he goes into the woods and it's spooky and there's an old man. The devil. The (laughs) the devil. (laughs) (laughs) You can make a cool metal song about this. The old boy himself. The old, old Mr. Scratch himself. El Diablo, I guess. I mean, I don't, it doesn't actually say that. 
but he's got a snake staff and he looks exactly like young Goodman Brown. And he's like, I was there when your ancestors did evil things. And I definitely don't mean Hawthorne's evil ancestors. (laughs) I mean, young Goodman Brown's evil ancestors. This isn't some sort of catharsis for Hawthorne. No. (laughs) And we're off. (laughs) And then (laughs) when did the booketing just become about throwing shade at great works of literature, great works of art? Haven't we always been? (laughs) As far as I'm concerned, here's the list. Mona Lisa. Yeah. Young Goodman Brown. Yeah. (laughs) The King James Bible. Um, Yeah. These are all things that are Fine, I'm, I'm not going to throw any more shade, I promise. No, Brandon, you Maybe. can throw some shade, just like the forest is full of shade, and you never know who is in the forest. That's right, like all the witches go into the witches' meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and who else, who goes to the witches' meeting? Well, you might think Jake witches. doesn't go, because Jake seems like a pretty good guy. But there he is! <laughs> what? He's in the witches' meeting! You probably, but Brandon, now Brandon, Brandon, like, helps lead Awana. Yeah. He wouldn't be. What the? Brandon's at the witches' meeting. Yeah, man. Hey, look. <laughs> now, the one person you couldn't expect to be, I don't know. At a witches' meeting? Well, Who's the most pious person we can imagine? Who? I don't know. Na- Nathan? Imagine them. Nathan. Nathan? Oh, look, they're there. <laughs> <laughs> Not Nathan. <laughs> Who would have thought Nathan would be at a witches' meeting? Of all meeting? the booking guys, Nathan was the least likely to be at a witches' meeting. That's what all our listeners <laughs> definitely agree with. <sighs> guys... <laughs> It's fun to make fun of things, especially things that deserve it. <laughs> and Hawthorne was, could be a little bit obnoxious. But people don't want us to do that. We bother people when we make fun of things. No, I'm, I'm all for giving Poe and this guy what they deserve. But I will say, I read this story in high school and it got me. I thought it was pretty spooky. And I like yeah. this kind of spooky stuff. And I thought, you know, as a young man who had, came from a very hypocritical Pentecostal, charismatic, everything's wonderful. <laughs> Jesus gives us grace to basically live our best lives now. Joel Osteen's on the TV. Benny Hen's on the TV. That's the background I came up uh, came from. So for me personally, this story spoke to me simply because it said, you can't actually trust those people. The heart of man is dark. and <laughs> Like Desmond Dark. <laughs> like Desmond Dark. Whoa. And, and that was cool. Like the... The our great allegorical character. Our great alleg- yeah, we're 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 the we're masters of subtle irony, <laughs> iron, I- irony and satire uh, in the Warhorn and larger sanity verse. But the the part where the the evil minister of evilness gets up and and says like, you know, you old men are jerks, and you young men have helped the old men die, so you can get your inheritances. And you beautiful young maids, blush not. You have buried your babies with only me. In attendance at the funeral. <laughs> when he gets up and, uh, as a teenager, I'd have been like, whoa, people, like I know people, there's people at my church and they've had abortions and they haven't told, they've murdered their babies and they haven't told anybody. And people fornicate, like, and then they, they go to church and, and like, you know, I'm always being told that like Christian, you know, once you become a Christian, you just, the grace of God is just kind of infused into you and you're perfect. And that's not, but that's not, but I, that's not how I feel. And that's not what it looks, feels like my family is. And it's not what it feels like my friends are. So having somebody just like tell a story about like things are actually dark. It was meaningful. I'm saying that in a slightly mocking myself way, but I don't know. It was kind of nice. And then young Goodman Brown, his life is ruined by it. And it's kind of a good, it was kind of a good lesson too. I mean, it really was like, oh, well, shouldn't obsess about that stuff. Don't want to be young Goodman Brown. That guy died in gloom or whatever it was. He lost his faith. Like his wife named Faith with the pink ribbons in her hair. Except for he didn't because they were married, but they didn't like each other and he was gloomy all the time. You don't want to be a gloomy guess like young Goodman Brown. Do you think that's Hawthorne's point? What? (laughs) (laughs) That you don't want to be a gloomy guess like young Goodman Brown? (laughs) (laughs) Because I kind of think maybe it's that you're supposed to... So Hawthorne loves to play with this question of reality, what's Mm -hmm. true, what's not. And so, of course, this all could just be a dream. Right. But you're supposed to think that maybe it wasn't a dream. Mm -hmm. Or maybe at least he was getting some access to a truth that 
ruined his life because none of the other society, he would be ostracized for that truth. Right. He would be ostracized for his knowledge. That nobody wanted that knowledge because the whole society worked on that knowledge not being but Brandon, revealed. Isn't that how our society were like we are we are depraved and we are yeah. wicked. And do we want to acknowledge that? Do most people you walk into a gas station, you walk past somebody, does that person probably want to acknowledge that how wicked they really are? Isn't this where the gospel begins, Brandon? With young Goodman Brown. Yeah, I think the problem is is that everybody who needs to read a story like Young Goodman Brown and actually understand it never will read a story like Young Goodman Brown and actually understand Unless it. Unless they're made to in high school. Unless yeah. they're made to in high school, but they're not. It's, it doesn't do anything for those people usually. I don't know, they're it did like, for me. It did? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon looks so dejected. <laughs> Annoyed. <laughs> But oh, but then the guys who are going to end up being the kind that like Seven and Fight Club, mm -hmm. they're going to be the guys who inevitably find a story like Young Goodman Brown and just love it to death. Yes, I agree. I think there are very immature ways to use this story and to use Mask of the Red Death for that matter. Yeah. I think I want to make a little space for someone can write a dark allegory. And I think horror stories often do function for young people specifically as, yeah. as allegories about their own sin and their depravity. And they give them handles for ways to think about the lust and the darkness and the yeah. depravity so, that's in their own <clears throat> hearts. I read this story with my ninth graders last year. Mm -hmm. And we had a good discussion about the end and who Goodman Brown had become and what Hawthorne was trying to teach them and then what was wrong with what Hawthorne was doing. And also what was right with what Hawthorne was doing. It was a good discussion. But also then as we were reading it, we were making fun of it a bit too. Mm -hmm. And they were liking that because I think that they realized they didn't have to take it so seriously. Yeah. And I think that's the healthy way for a student to learn to approach something like this is that they can get something good out of it, but then they can also feel free to laugh at the silliness of how serious Hawthorne took himself. Because Hawthorne takes himself way too seriously Oh yeah, here. and it's obnoxious. And you're just like, Hawthorne, you you really think that this is like a revelation that nobody but you has ever had because it's the minister's black veil says the exact same mm -hmm. thing. Scarlet Letter. Scarlet Letter largely. says the exact same thing. Blythedale Romance pretty much says the exact same thing, just about a different thing. Transcendental utopian farms. Well, Hawthorne saw hypocrisy and it made him angry. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I blame him for that necessarily. He should have had the humility to see his own hypocrisy and to write his stories in such a way that he had some grace for his characters. Like he just obviously despises them and is angry with, you can kind of tell when an author is just angry with his, mm -hmm. his own creations. Like Hawthorne doesn't have any patience for anyone, certainly not for young Goodman Brown. Um, there's no sympathy here and there's really none for Hester or for uh, Roger Chillingsworth or any of those, maybe a yeah. little bit for Hester. But well, when, when reading Hawthorne, so I'm reading the Scarlet Letter now with right. my 10th graders, <clears throat> and it's it's like you're seeing a fascinating case study of someone who both loved this tradition, the New England, Bostonian, Salem, mm -hmm. Puritanism, but also hated it, and he couldn't come to real terms with it. And so there's this war going on, and you don't know if it's going to end with him figuring it out or if it's going to drive him insane. Right. And so you're watching because it's an interesting mental case study, but it's not fun. No, it's not. And that's one thing mm -hmm. that I miss with, that Poe even had more than Hawthorne, is just some sense of fun. He's still not making you laugh. Right. Th that's still something that they're both missing, is any sort of sense of- No, they are they have no sense of proportion, and therefore they have no sense of humor. Yeah. And so it never, it never becomes satire. Right. It's always just dark, gloomy, mm, mildewy allegory, and um, or just heavy-handed symbolism. And while it carries it, I mean, the hand, Red Death- had great images that st stick with me. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I think I prefer a good satire. Yeah, I do too. And especially for a novel. But I think a short story, one little bite-sized short, short story can strive, as Poe would tell us it should, for a singular effect or for have one point that it's striving towards. And so I have much... If, if Edgar Allan Poe had ever written a novel, it, insofar as Hawthorne did write novels, they're hard to take because they seem to encompass this worldview that's just angry and bitter and excludes all hope and all grace, but have a single story just make the point that people tend to be <clears throat> hypocr hypocrites and there's a lot of evil in the world. I don't, I don't have an intrinsic problem with that. I can criticize Hawthorne's career and Hawthorne's uh, character without thinking that there's anything particularly wrong with 
young Goodman Brown taken as a, a specimen of its type. Yeah. And even in, in its biting sort of uh, allegory, I mean, it works. It's fine. Yeah. It's, it's weird and one of a kind. I don't, I, I don't know of any of the story that quite does what it does. So it's got some spooky stuff. Just the idea I that think it's better than the crucible. Yeah. Oh, oh, please. I, yeah, well, we'll get to that. But it's the idea that when you walk in the woods, you're never alone. You never know whether you're, he you, you says, you know, I, th- I could be joined by lots of people right now. I just don't know. Yeah. That's pretty creepy and uncanny. Well, and there are a lot of horror stories even today. Like I never saw it, but I'm, I think the Vitch. The Vitch, yeah. I think it kind of capitalized on something very similar, a twist that was similar to this. Right? Oh, well, they're all capitalizing on Hawthorne's idea of who the Puritans were, and yeah. And then in the end, they're all the hypocrites you think they are, and in fact, they're not even. No, they're just outright witches. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, anything more to say about Young Goodman Brown? No, I think as a young guy, you took what you should have taken from it. Yeah, anybody that gets stuck there is an idiot. I mean, let me say that unequivocally. You cannot spend your life wallowing in this stuff. I think it's a single shot of something that might be helpful to some a certain sort of sensibility at a certain time. I don't really have a problem with it. Yeah, but just wallowing in it. Like, and I think that's what Hawthorne does is he tends to wallow in it. But knowing that it's not good to be a young Goodman Brown, that's that's a good take on it. Mm-hmm. Being able to distance yourself enough from the story to see, well, where this guy ends, that's not good. Because I think that Hawthorne, if you're reading the story as Hawthorne wants you to read it, I think you're seeing it not as a condemnation on young Goodman Brown at the end, but as a condemnation on his city. Society, yeah. Yeah. But to then read it as a condemnation on young Goodman Brown, that's that's good. That's an interesting, yeah. interesting interpretation, Nathan. Maybe not the right one, but it helped no. me at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, me and Jake were today. We're talking about Tolstoy because we both started reading War and Peace in preparation for our epic series that will probably hit in January if all goes according to plan. And we were talking about the difference between Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. And I don't remember exactly what we said, but one of them has, for one of one thing, one of them has a sense of humor, and one of them has a sense of proportion. Jake really liked a passage in um, Tolstoy about a young man who's what Jake just talking. It's yeah. It was just this little one-off kind of thing that you get all the time in Tolstoy where there's a young man who's pretty young, very self-satisfied and arguing for, you know, putting forward a point and arguing for it and uh, very naive and immature and doesn't realize that he's not really being taken seriously. The entire room is in on the joke that is him. He's the only one that's not in on it. Yeah. Um, But at the same time, you know, nobody's actually going to rob him of his sense of self-dignity and make him feel that he's the butt of the joke. It's more like everybody's just sort of smirking at some youthful insolence. Right. And I don't know. It makes you cringe and be embarrassed for the kid and be embarrassed for all the times that you yourself were probably laughed at without realizing it. Didn't even realize it. But also grateful that, you know, People could can laugh at your silly 16, 18, 20 year old, 16, 18, 20 year old you and have the have the good humor and the good sense to let you skate for a minute. Right. Which somebody like Tolstoy can offer a portrait like that. And it feels like a complete portrait and it contains the fact that the man was sinful, that the man was stupid, that it was kind of funny. You know, he's able to see it, see what's wrong with it and see it with compassion and humor all at the same time. It's a complete portrait of that. Whereas Dostoevsky, if he was writing the same thing, it would be about how stupid and insular and ridiculous and terrible the young man was and how everybody was having this internal drama and everything. And I only bring it up to illustrate the point that I think somebody like Hawthorne has a worldview that's very incomplete for lack of a better word. They're not going to show you anything like that with any kind of compassion. Compassion is completely absent from the universe yeah. of something yeah, like... Yeah, compassion and understanding about... You know, it's like Hawthorne doesn't believe that people change. He believes that people suck. Right. Because he sucks. You yeah. could write a great story about someone, even a great horrific allegory about someone who suddenly is granted knowledge of how wicked things really are. And then what does the man go and do with that? 
and I, you, there's all kinds of directions you could take take it. But just to assume, well, society sucks. There's nothing you can do about it except sit and be miserable about it. Which is which, what, which is what Hawthorne did with his life. Right. It's what Young Goodman Brown does, and I, I think it's a much better. It plays much better as a parable of Goodman Brown's hypocrisy. Right. Like, oh, he judges everybody else. Yeah. Or is suspicious of everybody else, and therefore he lives a miserable, secluded, terrible life while feeling morally superior to everyone else around him. He's After like, he, he's the hypocrite. He was going to the coven, right? Like that's what he kissed yeah. his wife and said, "I'm going to go join the witches." Like that was what he set out to do. It would make faith poor. My poor faith tremble if she knew what I was going to do. It says something like that. Yep. And then when he sees her there, he wants to be all uppity about it. Well, how many lampposts for young Goodman Brown? Seven. Cool. Two. Two. All right. And I'll (laughs) give it 900. (laughs) Guys, let's call out Andrew and Esther, the lovebirds. Oh! Ow! You got me. (laughs) The key master, like in Ghostbusters. Ah! (laughs) That's good. David's frighty men trucking. Ah! John and Jill and little baby sacks of heads. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Jay and Katie, who are cold and love screams, and also C.S. Lewis, who had some bad theology. Ah! Scary princess of wonder and crappiness, mother death. <laughs> Console dime like the dime that you'd buy a ten penny dreadfuls with. Console dime, Adam. Oh no! And that's enough donors for today. We'll see you next week for another episode of the Spookany. Next week, huh? Or no, tomorrow! Thank you.